If you've grown up in the West over the past 150 years or so, then every institution you've known, including science, technology, education, medicine, and more, has been shaped by one theory, Darwin's theory of evolution. Darwin named his 1859 book On the Origin of Species for a reason. His theory tries to explain where Earth's creatures come from and how they got their unique features. The key word here is origin, because the origin of something tells a story about it. You've probably heard the same concept in today's superhero films. It's called an origin story. An origin story shows how regular people become superheroes. The origin story then explains the hero's actions and motivations. Take Batman, for example. He fights crime because his parents were murdered by a criminal. Captain America similarly transforms from a weak young man into a patriotic super soldier after a World War II era medical experiment. And Peter Parker becomes Spider-Man because he was bitten by a radioactive spider. The important point is, if you change the hero's origin story, you change the hero. In the same way, Darwin's theory of evolution in his book on the origin of species was meant to provide an origin story for not just every animal on Earth, but also humans, and that matters way more than you might think. Which is why, as I'll show in this video, Darwin's idea doesn't act like a normal theory anymore. What we actually have is closer to Darwin's theology of evolution, and there are three big reasons why. First, evolution needs believers to accept certain ideas on faith, except these are ideas that new evidence keeps undermining. Second, anyone questioning evolution faces public outrage. People risk their reputations by speaking up, and not just scientists either. Even everyday people like you and me feel afraid to ask informed questions. There's no logical reason for this fear, except for the third reason. Because Darwin created his origin theory to replace another explanation of our origins, the one from the Bible. As you can probably now see, evolution has won this battle at the institutional level. This victory has led to serious problems in our past, our present, and possibly our future. Hello, I'm Will Spencer, host of the Will Spencer Podcast. I spent 20 years exploring the New Age, visiting over 30 countries before finding my way to Christ. Now I help young men build their Christian faith, and I interview authors, thought leaders, and influencers who help us understand our changing world. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, The Will Spencer Podcast, for more. Okay, before we get too deep into Darwin's theory of evolution, let's be clear about what it actually claims. Darwin said evolution works through something called natural selection. In a world of limited resources for food and shelter, species must fight to survive. They struggle to reproduce while competing with other species in a harsh environment. As this happens, animals develop small changes in their size, shape, color, and other features. Some of these changes give certain animals advantages over others of their kind. These helpful changes then pass down to future generations. This helps the species survive and develop over time. Finally, after letting this process run for millions of years, we get the diversity of complex species that we see today. This is Darwin's theory for the origin story of all the creatures on Earth. Today's animals come from other, older animals developing over a long, slow, gradual process of often random but useful transformations. Remember how I said the theory of evolution is actually more like a theology of evolution? This is because it requires us to take a few things on faith. One of the things that evolution requires us to take on faith is that the transitions between species can be documented. Think about a hero's origin story again. We see every step of young Bruce Wayne becoming Batman. We watch him learn martial arts, high technology, costume design, everything. Without seeing these steps, we wouldn't believe his transformation. That's how we understand our own lives, too, as a step-by-step -step process of development. Batman has his steps, we have ours. Surely, for a theory as important as evolution, we should see species change over time, too, right? But we don't. If Darwin's theology were correct, we should find countless fossils showing these transitions. The fossil record should back up his idea of a slow, step-by-step -step process of development. For example, in his original book, Darwin claimed that given enough time, bears could transform into whales. 
He was ridiculed for this idea and ultimately retracted it. But it makes the point clear. We should find millions of years of fossils showing bears becoming whales, or perhaps dinosaurs becoming birds. Remember this famous scene from the movie Jurassic Park? The scientist Alan Grant explains how the Velociraptor was an ancestor of modern birds. Half moon shaped bones on the wrist. There's no one of these guys learn how to fly. <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe dinosaurs have more in common with present day birds than they do with reptiles. Look at the pubic bone turned backward, just like a bird. Look at the vertebrae full of air sacs and hollows, just like a bird. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. Grant bases this on something called homology, the idea that similar looking species must be related. Now that idea has its own problems that are way beyond this video's scope. But if Grant were right, wouldn't we see fossils of velociraptors slowly becoming different kinds of birds? Shouldn't we see lots of other transitions too? We should, but we don't. What the fossil record actually shows is something very different. We find fully formed species appearing suddenly with no gradual evolutionary predecessors. An example of this is the Cambrian explosion, which is said to have occurred 535 million years ago. This is when almost all major animal body types first appeared. How long did this explosion last? Just 5 to 10 million years a mere blink in geological time. In this tiny window, species jumped straight to forms we'd recognize today, skipping all those supposed transitional steps. This isn't a one-time thing, by the way. Scientists have found at least 14 other similar events. The famous biologist Eugene Koonin called these biological big bangs. Now, I want to share some examples, but many have some tricky names. So here's a clip from the Discovery Science Institute where paleontologist Gunter Beckley will explain a few of those in a delightful German accent. The phenomenon of sudden appearances in the fossil record is not just an exceptional case, but actually is a pattern that is found everywhere. The origin of life, the origin of photosynthesis, the Avalon explosion, the great Ordovician biodiversification event, the Silurio-Devonian terrestrial revolution, the devonian nekton revolution, and the Odontoad revolution, the Carboniferous insect explosion, the Triassic explosions, the origin of flowering plants, the origin of butterflies, the neo-avian revolution of modern birds, the placental mammal radiation, the origin of the genus Homo, and finally, the upper paleolithic human revolution. Did you catch that? There are no transitional forms for flowering plants butterflies, or modern birds. Looks like Alan Grant isn't the only fictional character in Jurassic Park. But wait, there's more. The second reason I call Darwin's theory a theology is that it's taken on one of the worst traits of dogmatic religion. You can't question it. Try questioning it, and you face public ridicule. Here's what Richard Dawkins wrote in his book River Out of Eden, A Darwinian View of Life. Quote, It is absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane. Or wicked, but I'd rather not consider that." End quote. So, if Dr. Dawkins still stands by this quote, he'd call me ignorant, stupid, insane, or even wicked for making this video. Now think about that pressure. Here's a fellow of the Royal Society of London, author of 16 books, the man who invented the term meme. No wonder people fear questioning evolution. But a growing tide of scientists are beginning to speak up. In fact, more than 1,000 PhD scientists, experts in biology, chemistry, and physics have signed a public statement expressing serious doubts about Darwinian evolution. They see what we've seen. The fossil evidence doesn't support evolution's basic claims. And remember the Royal Society, that prestigious group that Dawkins belongs to? They've held meetings of top evolutionary biologists to address growing problems with the theory not fitting the facts. Ask yourself, if the science were settled, why are so many accomplished researchers speaking up? If the evidence were clear, why are leading scientists struggling with these obvious problems? And why would Dawkins and plenty of others need to call people insane, stupid, or wicked just for asking informed questions? This matters deeply because evolution's claims lead to some troubling conclusions. Remember what we learned about origin stories? If you change the origin, you change the hero. 
So what happens when you change humanity's origin? What if instead of being made in God's image, humans are just advanced animals as Darwin suggested? Well, as it turns out, this leads to some really uncomfortable conclusions. If humans descended from animals gradually, with transitional forms over millions of years, then wouldn't it stand to reason that some humans are further along that evolutionary path than others? And maybe some humans alive today are those transitional forms. Now, modern evolutionists try to distance themselves from these ideas. But not only are they logical conclusions, but many evolutionists once believed them. And these ideas were used to justify discrimination, eugenics, and much more. This movement was called social Darwinism. One key figure was British philosopher Herbert Spencer, trust me, no relation, who coined the term survival of the fittest. Spencer proposed that we apply Darwinian principles to society with minimal economic and government intervention. Let human evolution follow the same path as animal evolution. The fittest would survive, the weak would die off. Now, if man is made in the image of a mere animal, what's the harm in this? We could let whole nations or people groups die, and it's just nature taking its course. If you find this horrifying, congratulations, you have a conscience, something, by the way, that animals don't have. Another influential figure was William Graham Sumner, an American sociologist. He saw humans as fighting two battles, one against nature, another against each other. Sumner believed that these two competitions produced more fit and less fit groups of people, and that attempting to abolish these struggles would lead to the spread of the quote, unfit. Now here's what Sumner wrote in Earth Hunger and other essays. Quote, Before the tribunal of nature, a man has no more right to life than a rattlesnake. He has no more right to liberty than any wild beast. His right to pursuit of happiness is nothing but a license to maintain the struggle for existence. End quote. Think about that. If we're just evolved animals, how can we have rights? But if we're made in God's image, how can we not? And let me tell you about a third key figure, Ernst Haeckel. You might not know his name, but you know his influence. He was a German biologist who gave us the term ecology, a word you've probably heard several times this week. Search his name on Amazon. You'll find dozens of books and even sticker sets featuring his detailed animal drawings, which he made long before photography existed. For these reasons and more, Haeckel is huge in today's environmental movement. But here's what many don't know. Ernst Haeckel believed the German people were the most superior race on Earth. Don't take my word for it, though. Here's a quote from the International Encyclopedia of the First World War. Quote, Haeckel, Germany's most influential social Darwinist, believed in an autocratic German state and the superiority of German culture. He advocated humanity's collective struggle as expressed through militarism, nationalism, imperialism, and racial competition. Haeckel therefore condoned Germany's entry into the First World War." End quote. And you can probably see where all this is going. Later, a certain mustachioed German leader took Haeckel's ideas into his book Mein Kampf. He wrote about the struggle for existence, survival of the fittest, racial hierarchies, and superior races dominating inferior ones, including through military force. This thinking then helped justify the German invasion of, quote, inferior Slavic Poland on September 1st, 1939, starting World War II. Remember what I said about evolution being a theology with devastating effects on our past, present, and future? This is what I meant. And this theology wasn't an accident either. It was designed to replace the dominant human origin story, Christianity. Now, you might doubt this. Maybe you think evolution's theological impact was unintended. No one meant to replace Christianity. It just happened naturally. The fittest explanation survived, right? Well, let me change your mind. Ernst Haeckel wrote to Charles Darwin on Darwin's 70th birthday. He congratulated Darwin for having, quote, shown man his place in nature and therefore overthrowing the anthropocentric fable, end quote. What is the anthropocentric fable, you might ask? It's the idea that man is made in God's image with the command to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis 1 verse 28. Now, Haeckel wrote to Darwin in 1879. Even then, the German biologist celebrated how Darwin's origin story had replaced the Christian one. It showed man our, quote, true place in nature. 
just steps away from beasts, and some of us more steps than others. And that's what the theology of evolution comes down to. First, it demands faith in things the fossil record disproves. Second, it silences questions through shaming and professional threats, though thankfully that's starting to change. Third and finally, it was crafted and spread to promote anti-Christian and therefore anti-human ideas. We must stop this now. Because evolution's impact didn't end with World War II. If we're still evolving to match changing conditions, and if the fittest still survive, then who's to say that any seemingly helpful change we want to make to humans is right or wrong? Think about transgenderism, for example. Imagine a post-industrial world where machines and AI androids do all of our heavy work, where we grow babies in technological wombs, a process called ectogenesis that scientists are working on right now. In that world, wouldn't fixed gender roles seem outdated? Why would men need strength? Why would women need to bear children? Robots could do all the work, and you could be whatever you choose, even surgically. It's just adapting to new conditions, right? Times change. So why shouldn't the sexes change too? And that's why I'm making this video, no matter what Dr. Dawkins might call me. Ignorant, stupid, or wicked. He named his book River Out of Eden for a reason, so that we might leave behind our origins in the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis. Except, when you change humanity's origin story, you change humanity itself. We transform from men into beasts. We become meat to be carved up, exploited, and thrown away like cattle. As William Graham Sumner argued, we can't even claim rights beyond the right to fight for our survival. So if you want to understand why the past 150 years look the way they do in both the pre- and post-war period, Darwin's theory or theology of evolution is a major reason. Except, neither the theory nor the theology fits the facts. And now I believe it's time to overthrow the Darwinian fable. And I know just the man to do it, too. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share with friends. For more content like this, subscribe to my YouTube channel or follow me on X. And I probably don't need to tell you to leave a comment about this one. Until next time, friends.